Welcome. You know, as I was preparing my sermon for this week, I came across an essay uh, that was part of a book by Heather Heverleski, who says, what if this were enough? And in this, she speaks about um, the life of Wolfgang Mozart. Um, she writes this, she says, Mozart composed an enormous volume of music over the course of his short life, which by the way, was only 35 years of age. And he was working relentlessly from his youth to his death. He composed music as a child in a horse-drawn carriage, traveling with his father, and he wrote music even when he was sick or in debt. And though he's often portrayed as temperamental, unsteady, and erratic, his productivity never suffered. He found a way to shut out distractions and do the hard work, the hard patient work necessary to compose transcendent music. What's interesting is that in her, in her writing, she, Heather writes that Mozart's father, Leopold, viewed his son's musical talent as a miracle given by God. His father believed that it was his job to help Mozart share his, his uh, miracle with the world. In Mozart's time, composers weren't seen as an exalted class. In fact, uh, Paul Johnson writes in his biography of Mozart, musicians were exactly in the same position as other household servants, cooks, chambermaids, coachmen, sentries. They existed for the comfort and well-being of their masters and mistresses. Leopold Mozart, though, didn't agree. He believed that his son should be displayed to the glory of God, as he put it. Imagine being told that your talent is a miracle and that you have just one job. You don't have to be happy or successful or attractive or well-balanced as a human being. You don't have to accrue wealth or maintain lots of friendships or seem impressive in any other way. You don't have to tweet or share photos of your latest sheet music on Instagram or start a podcast about composing to increase your visibility and expand the size of your platform. You just have to do your one job to the best of your ability. Imagine being told that you have been given your talent by God and you must honor God, uh, God's will by manifesting that talent in your creations. You know, when I read that essay, I thought Israel it was exactly in that position. And so is the church of God, by the way. They are called by God, blessed by God, and promised a favored future. Our Father believes in His children, and they were simply to love God by presenting His will and ways before the world. What potential existed for them? However, we're discovering, right, in, the, in our study on the book of Judges, which, by the way, is written during Israel's uh, period, uh, where it was just a downward slide and they continue to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. Our most recent study looking at the life of Samson shows that this, this rebellion led to an oppression by the Philistines for 40 years. See, they squandered their potential. In, in a display of God's grace, though, God once again raises up a deliverer who will contend against these Philistines. And yet, in our study last week, when we look at Samson part one, the birth announcement of Samson reveals some glaring deficiencies on the part of his parents. There's a marked lack in their knowledge of God, in their understanding on how to live for God. In fact, even in knowing God. However, when we mention the name Samson, Potential is a word that comes to mind. I mean, think about this. Samson is this miracle baby, literally. God announces his birth to a childless, sterile woman. Samson is called by God from the womb, set apart, set apart in service to God in a vow known as a Nazarite vow. The Lord blesses him, and the Spirit of the Lord strengthens him, and he possesses extraordinary gifts to meet exceptional opportunities. Yet I want you to hear me on this. 
Samson accomplishes less for his people than any of the other deliverers that were before him. In fact, of all of Samson, uh, uh, Samson's exploits, they're always personal, and his victories are really private. It has to deal with Samson. In fact, Samson never leads an army. He never will bring victory to Israel, and Samson never establishes peace from the Philistines. Samson, uh, Samson's potential is never realized. See, if we're not careful, the same could be said of God's church in our day. We could hear people say his church has so much potential, great gifts, divine strength, everything that they need for life and godliness. The potential is there, but we have to guard ourselves against being distracted from fulfilling our calling. We have to guard against displacing eternal things with temporal ones. And we must be strong and courageous or we will see our potential floundered away. I want you to allow me some time today to make the case for realizing one's potential. In fact, a strong case for embracing all that God has for you. A strong case for persevering in your walk with God. So let's go and take another look at the story of Samson. We have to go to Judges chapter 13, beginning at verse 25, and we read this. The Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Menahedan between Zorah and Eshtael. Samson went down to Timnah, and there he saw a young Philistine woman. And when he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Well, his father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all of our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. Now, we're being introduced to a plot here, and I want you to understand a couple of things about this, because this is the part of Bible study that I find so intriguing. There's a restlessness that falls upon Samson. And so he heads down to Timnah, and there he comes across a young Philistine woman, tells his parents, basically, I want her. And his parents object, but consider their grounds. Don't they write, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all your people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? I mean, that's their argument, right? Like, why are you going there? You got, you got great women here in, 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 our, in, our, in our tribe, within the, the family of Israel. Why are you doing this? But you notice what is not being said? They did not remind Samson of God's decree. Way back when God was going to give them this land, it came with some contingencies. It says this in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 to 4. He says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you're entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. See, you notice there was no reminding them of what God's will is in this. And they thereby, they're not really helping Samson to really reach his potential. They also did not remind Samson of his Nazarite vow. Look in Judges 14, 4 through 7. It says his parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines, for at that time they were ruling over Israel. See, this is a pivotal text. Now, within the greater plot of Samson's life, now we're seeing that there is this subplot. And, and do you notice here in verse 4, where it says, this was from the Lord, that God is now the initiator. And why would God be looking for an occasion to confront the Philistines? 
You see, it's important to remember three things as we read these passages. If we're really going to understand what's going on in the broader plot, you need to understand something of this subplot. And to understand that, you have to go back and realize that the land in which Samson, his family, that, that during this period of judges, the land in which they're living is under the judgment of God. In fact, way back in Deuteronomy again, looking at verses 5 and 6, this is what we read. It says, it is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you're going in to take possession of their land. But notice this, he says, but on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Do you understand then that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land to possess? For you are a stiff-necked people. In other words, God understood that th this land is under judgment. That's why God is going to displace them. And you need to understand that right off the bat. The second thing that you need to understand is that they had failed in their assignment, and now they are experiencing the consequences. So again, when we look to the book of Judges, we read this in chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, Because this nation has violated the covenant that I laid down for their forefathers and has not listened to me. You get it? What we just read in Deuteronomy, they failed to act on. They did intermarry. They did take on the idolatrous practices of the nations around them. And so God was saying, because in Judges now, he's telling them, because you violated this covenant, you have not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. In fact, notice what he says, I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their forefathers did. So now this contention, this oppression that they were feeling in this present instance with the Philistines, I want you to know, third, that while the Philistines were oppressing Israel, it, it appears from, from the story as we're learning it, that um, left to himself, Samson would never have become involved in God's or even Israel's agenda. And left to themselves, the Israelites would have been satisfied to continue to coexist with the Philistines. But God has other plans. Because, see, God wants to preserve his people for himself. That's why we read and we continue with our story now. God is looking for an occasion to, 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 um, to provoke the, the Philistines because Israel should have been displacing this nation. They've been, they should have been an instrument of righteousness in God's hands, but they've failed to do that now. So when we go back to the major plot, notice this. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. They approached the vineyards of Timnah, and suddenly a young lion came roaring towards him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power, so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Do you notice that God is orchestrating this entire scene? We talk about this lion appearing out of nowhere. No doubt God knew it was there. And notice how God's power, it says in your text, it says that it came upon him. It literally means rushing upon him. The scene will play into what we just read about an occasion to confront the Philistines. So man's ways may prove contrary to God's ways, yet are used by God to accomplish his will and purpose. That's, that's what is beginning to happen here. Samson is, show, Samson is showing that he has no intention really of living up to his vows or fulfilling God's will or being this instrument of justice, bringing judgment upon a rebellious people like the Philistines? No, no, no. Instead, it's all about Samson. 
But God could use that anyway, and he will. Let me just give you a little side illustration of this. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, the apostle Peter says this. He says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. You catch that? This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. You see, what they meant for evil, God meant for good. They were responsible for their actions. However, their actions played into God's will and purpose. Can we stop there for a moment? You catch then what's going on? Like that text where it talks about Jesus and his ministry, it says that it was God's set purpose for Jesus to experience this sacrificial atonement on our behalf. But how it happened, it came by their hands, and they're responsible. And that's why this idea that God has a set will and purpose, but somehow or another, even when we are walking in, in a complete opposite direction from what God's will and purposes are, it's not that he is impotent, that he, he, he's losing control, but rather what you will find that God is using all that to still accomplish his will and purposes, though the people who are now engaged in it, they're not living up to their potential. In fact, it's really sad to see what's coming, what's going to happen to them. So let's go back to our plot then, the major plot. And here's a reminder. Samson was called to be a Nazarite, which meant he was to abstain from anything that came from the grape. In other words, any fermented drink or eating of the grape itself. In addition, he was never to cut his hair during the period of this vow. He was not to eat anything unclean. And listen to this, he was not to go near a dead body because it would render him unclean. So now having said that to you, I want you to follow along with this story of Samson. We read this, it said sometime later, when Samson went back to marry this Philistine woman, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass dead animal, not supposed to be touching it. In it was a swarm of bees and some honey, which he scooped out with his hands and ate as he went along, unclean food. And when he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, causing them now to stumble, and they ate it too. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. And now his father went down to see the woman and Samson, made a feast there, as was customary for bridegrooms. When he appeared, he was given 30 companions. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them, and if you can give me the answer within the seven days of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Tell us your riddle, they said. Let us hear it. And he replied, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. Well, for three days, they could not give the answer. And Samson, as you notice in this text, does what he wants. Samson eats what's unclean, defiles himself by touching this dead carcass, lies to his parents, defiling them with what was unclean. When it says that Samson made a feast, the word for feast here is a word in that context that meant a seven-day drinking bout at the home of the bride's parents. This exposes something of Samson's character. He was called to be so things so much different, so much potential in Samson's life. But instead, having been called to walk with God, his life betrays that calling. It's easy, I think, sometimes when you read stories like this to begin to point the finger at Samson 
But I, I really want to ask you a question with me. Because this whole thing looked at God's will and, 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 and his purpose for Samson and for Israel. And now none of them are living up to that potential. And it's easy sometimes to look and point the finger and say, look how deficient they are. But God has a call on our lives too. And we can't just excuse our own faithless behavior at times. Listen, when I, when I read this passage, I, I, I need to tell you that I stopped for a moment and I thought to myself, oh God, like, it's so easy to read a page and see this in someone else. It's really hard sometimes to see that in yourself. And I just prayed and I said, Lord, I, I just ask you to forgive me for those times when I had the opportunity to do the good and I didn't. When I forget that I'm called to represent you well. When there's this conflicting desire sometimes in my heart that sometimes could be more compelling than my love for you or for your ways. That's the truth. I'm just being honest with you. I, I have the same problems with this flesh and blood that you do. But I don't, I don't want to forfeit this potential that God has given. I want to step into all the gifts that he's given me. And you know what? I'm thankful that God is forgiving. I'm thankful that he welcomes the sinner, that he's full of mercy and compassion to all who call on him. So what are the, those areas in your life that God may be asking you to reform? We say we love God, but what about a bad temper? What about a loose tongue that gives itself to gossip? What about living with envy? Listen, whatever the Spirit of God may be saying to you right now is of critical importance. Don't let the moment escape. Because if nothing else, the main plot here is that Samson, he's not experiencing the favor of God. And the subplot here, again, do you notice how God's involved in this? Think for a moment. How do you get honey from the dead carcass? Well, yes, the bees and everything were there, and they were forming this honeycomb, and they performed it. But in a dead carcass, would you not expect to find maggots and flies? <laughs> and here we have honey. God is showing himself to be at work even beside, behind the scenes because God's will is always going to move forward. And he said he was going to use this occasion to confront the Philistines. Well, notice what happens in verse 15 of Judges chapter 14. He says, on the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, going back to this riddle, right? They said, coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us. Or, and notice how violent this all of a sudden turns. Have your husband explain the riddle to us or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Did you invite us here to rob us? Samson's wife threw herself on him sobbing, you hate me. You really don't love me. You've given my people a riddle but haven't told me the answer. She cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her because she continued to press him. She in turn explained the riddle to her people. And before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town said to Samson, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. And then the spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. And in a rage, he goes down to Ashkelon a Philistine city on the coast, and he struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of their belongings, gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he goes back to his father's house, and Samson's wife was given to a friend who had attended him at his wedding. You notice how the Philistines show their heart? We're going to burn you and your father's household to death. These are not good people. And, over, and all of this over a bet. 
And you notice how Samson's wife, the one that he says, she looks good to me. I want her for me. She's perfect for me. Winds up betraying him. And you see again how Samson displays a callousness towards her and her parents. He says, I haven't explained it to my father and mother, so why should I explain it to you? But what you really see here is Samson's unbridled life sows the seeds that are going to reap a harvest of trouble. Thirty men of Ashkelon pay a dear price. And this escalation is going to boil over at much personal cost. You can go on and read what happens in chapter 15, where it records the downward spiral that lays waste the Philistines, Israel, even Samson himself. And it's sad that they never repent. So what's the subplot again? Though Samson plays the role of faithless Israel, you do notice that God is remaining faithful in his covenant to his people. He's going to judge the Philistines, whether Samson does it willingly or unwillingly, consciously or unconsciously. And our rebellion is always going to lead to our undoing. So Samson is going to pay the price where he could have done something really great. You see, God's sovereignty over the affairs of men, I think, is the strongest case I could make to follow his direction. And why is that? Because when your, when your life and purpose is aligned with his, when all the gifts, when all of the blessings that God pours out into our life are used in a way that honors him, don't you understand that God's purposes will always prevail, which is what you see in this story. So that's why realizing our potential is dependent on how we respond to God's ways. See, Samson was to be a deliverer, to bring peace, to, to rid the land of this rebellious people. And instead it became all about Samson. And nothing good was accomplished. And all that potential is wasted. No. You want to reach your potential. Live in a way that responds to God's ways and his will. It's the strongest argument. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this text, a story that perhaps on first blush may not seem like it really relates that much to where we live today until we recognize again that you have a will and a purpose and that we too live in a day where people are walking in, in ways that are so contrary to yours. It can feel, Lord, sometimes like what we're doing is really of no consequence. But just like in this story, we can see your active engagement, working behind the scenes, working through these events that to those who are participating don't seem as if you are involved in them at all. And yet when your eyes are open to see, you can see something of your hand and of your grace moving in every in every um, aspect of these stories. I pray, Lord, that you would teach us to just so order our steps that we would please you. Because in doing so, not only will we live up to this potential that you have placed in us, but also, Father, we would receive your blessing. The confidence, Lord, in the present to know that you are with us and will never forsake us. And the undying hope, Lord, of life abundant. So I thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.